Joining us on Superheroes of Science today, we have Seema Matu, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Purdue University. So welcome, Seema. Hi, nice to meet you all. <laughs> we appreciate you taking time to uh, sit down with us on the computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that you started to tell us a second ago a little bit more about yourself. If you could uh, go ahead and go, go ahead and go with that thought yeah, and sure. uh, kind of explain what, uh, what and who you are. Sure, sure. Why not? Um, so, yeah, I, I always like to tell people a little bit about myself because where we come from um, kind of in some way formulates where what we do, our careers and our uh, and the kind of research that I'm doing in my lab. Um, so I grew up in India. Um, I came here in the middle of college. I um, finished my college at the University of Maryland, College Park, so a terrapin. Uh, and then I went to all the way out to the West Coast to UCLA to get my PhD in microbiology and immunology. Um, so I am trained as a bacterial geneticist. While I was at UCLA, I um, I studied the bug that causes whooping cough. It's called Bordetella. Oh. And so the current vaccine that, that we have, um, that's built off of um, some of the work that I did as a graduate student. So some of the findings that we did to try to figure out how do you get a better vaccine? How do you get a vaccine that doesn't have as many side effects? So that was the work that I did as a graduate student. Um, and then I decided, okay, I've gone and learned all this stuff from the bacterial side of things. Um, and so I kind of wanted to learn more about the eukaryotic, the human side of things. Um, and for this, I wanted to learn more about protein. So I had kind of started with things from, the, from a genetics point of view, looking at DNA. Now I wanted to be able to just read protein sequences and be able to make educated guesses about what they might be doing. And so for that, I did a, what's called a postdoctoral training. So after you finish your PhD, you, you work a little longer. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and, and so for that, I went to the University of California in San Diego. I was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute fellow. Um, and this is where I started learning more biochemistry, um, trying to look at more, look at things just from an enzyme point of view, just from what the protein is doing. And so while I was doing this, I ended up uh, discovering a new kind of uh, enzyme that, um, that had, that's been around, but nobody really knew what it did. Um, and so that's, that particular enzyme carries out a reaction called ampelation or adenylation. Okay. And I can tell you a little bit more about this. Um, and so I'll just kind of tell you this story. I found this enzyme in bacteria because I was a bacteriologist and I was studying how bacteria cause disease. And interestingly, after I found it in bacteria, I found the same enzyme is there in humans as well. And so that was the big question, what is the human protein doing? And so when I set up my lab at Purdue, that's where, what, what we started the lab on. So what was, that was the big question. So that's the big gist of you know, how I got here. And I can now take you a little bit into um, what my lab does. Oh, yeah, that'd be perfect. Uh, yeah. All right. So I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see this. Yes. All right. So as I said, the reaction that this uh, protein carries out is called ampelation. And I sometimes uh, title it as what bacteria taught us about Parkinson's disease, because that has kind of been my journey. Um, starting off with studying bacteria and finding this enzyme in bacteria and then seeing that it's there in humans. And in humans, we found that this enzyme seems to be important for diseases like Parkinson's disease. And so that's kind of, in a nutshell, what my lab looks at. So um, because of my multidisciplinary background, that's kind of what my lab does, do, does too. We incorporate microbiology, cell biology, so how bacteria infect human cells. And then we also do structure biology. So whenever we find proteins, we want to see what these proteins look like. How do they interact with each other? Um, and so it's a multidisciplinary approach that we take to identifying, um, uh, answering scientific problems. So the proteins that we work on are called FIC proteins. And this is what it stands for, filamentation induced by cyclic AMP. You don't need to worry about the details. 
But, but the reason it's called fig is because the, the gene was first found in E. coli, in bacteria. And normally, you know, high school students will know that bacteria divide by what's called binary fission. One bacterium becomes two. But if you have a mutation in this fig gene, the bacteria grow, but they just don't divide. So they, instead of looking like these little dots, they end up looking like these big long filaments or these long rods. So that's how the protein got its name. Um, but these proteins are everywhere. They're not just in bacteria. Um, they're all the way from bacteria to fungi to, to flies to worms to mice to humans. Um, and what we figured out when I was uh, a postdoc was that these fig proteins carry out what are called post-translational modifications. And so um, students will know, bi biology students will know, just because you have DNA doesn't mean you're going to have a functional protein. So DNA in the cell gets trans, uh, transcribed into RNA, and then that RNA becomes a protein. And so we have about, say, 25,000 genes. This can give rise to 100,000 types of RNAs, which can give rise to 100,000 types of proteins. But then these proteins can get chemically modified. They can get decorated with sugars, with lipids, with phosphates, and whatever else. And by doing so, these 100,000 proteins can take on, so the same protein with a different modification can have a slightly different function. And because of that, you get really high complexity in the kinds of proteins we have inside our cells. Okay. So these post-translational modifications are really what are critical for determining a protein's function. And what we found was that these thick proteins carry out a new kind of post-translational modification. Um, it's traditionally, ch chemists will know it as adenylation. Nowadays, it's also being referred to as ampelation, because what these proteins do is they take ATP, and they break down ATP and add a part of the ATP called AMP, onto their target. And by doing so, they can change the function of this particular protein. Okay. So fig proteins carry out ampelation. They decorate proteins with AMP, and then they change the function of these proteins, of their target proteins, because of that modification. Now, we originally found this, this enzyme in bacteria because I was studying bacteria. So I was studying this bacterium called Histophilus, which uh, would cause disease in cows. And it caused disease in these cows because of, it had a thick protein. So what would happen is that the bacterium would secrete a thick protein, which would enter into the cells of the cows. And normal cells that are nice and flat like this over here would end up dying. They would become totally round. Okay. Oh, wow. And by doing that, the bacterium could now escape the immune response, could spread all over the cow. And we figured out that the way it was able to kill our human cells was by adding an AMP onto human proteins, and which would cause the cell to collapse and die. So this was a new way by which bacteria could use these fake proteins to cause disease. And so that was really, really cool. But remember, I said that these fake proteins are found everywhere in nature. They're also found in humans. In fact, humans have only one fig protein and that fig protein is called hype. So I started wondering, well, <laughs> these are bacterial toxins that are there meant to kill human cells. So why do humans have this protein? Does the human protein do the same thing? Like, I doubt it, because it's not going to be sitting there killing our own cells. So maybe it has the same enzymatic activity, but maybe it's doing something else. And so what is this human protein? What is hype doing? And that was the big question when I started my lab. And so to answer this, we said, OK, let's start looking inside the cell, and let's go see you know, if we can figure out where hype goes. And so you know, biology students will know this is an animal cell. It has a lot of different compartments. One of the compartments is called the endoplasmic reticulum. And so we started looking around, and we ended up developing some really nice imaging techniques. And what we found was that our human fig protein, this hype, goes to the endoplasmic reticulum. Here we, in yellow is the hype. And what we've done is we've been able to take images of hype inside the human cell 
and then compile these images so that we can get a three-dimensional structure of what hype would look like inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So in blue are the boundaries of the endoplasmic reticulum and inside in yellow you see is where hype is and we only see it inside the ER. And if you look at the um, staining again, you can see these dark stains all along the wall of the endoplasmic reticulum, that is hype. So great, we figured out hype goes to the ER. Now, what could it be doing in the ER? And again, um, biology students will know that in the ER is where um, proteins are made. So the ribosomes are on the surface of the ER and often when proteins are made, they can enter into the ER. And, but then for a protein to function properly, it needs to now be properly folded. It has to have the correct shape. If it has the wrong shape, the protein is going to be non-functional and often it can become toxic to the cell. So what we found was that hype plays a really critical role in how proteins that are misfolded get properly folded in the ER. And it does so through a protein, a chaperone, that is important for protein folding. Okay. And so really what we found was that hype plays this critical role in determining whether a cell will live or die um, under the stress of misfolded protein. So if you have too many toxic proteins, the cell has to decide, hey, can I try to refold these proteins? Or, uh-oh, there's just too many, too many uh, misfolded proteins, it's too toxic, I can't survive, so I'm gonna die. And so we find that hype plays a really important role in that decision-making on how well, a pro how well a cell will deal with misfolded proteins. Okay. So this was really exciting, because this is, Protein folding is a basic function in cells. Cells will live or die, depending on how well proteins get folded. So, well, hey, this is great. This is a really basic function. But then, how could we apply it to disease? Can we learn something about disease from what we just figured out was the function for hype? So we said, all right, hype seems to be so important in how a cell deals with the stress of toxic misfolded proteins. So that would mean that any disease where protein misfolding happens could potentially need hype, right? And so one such disease, I'm sure you know of many other diseases like that, but one such disease is Parkinson's disease. So in Parkinson's disease, what happens is that there is a protein called alpha-synuclein, okay? <clears throat> this is a protein that's found in our nerve cells. Now this protein, as we age, has a tendency to start aggregating. So it has a normal fold, but then over time, it has a tendency to start aggregating. It forms these big fibrils, these clusters that cannot function properly. They end up showing up inside nerve cells as these clumps. They also start poking holes in nerve cells. And because of this, motor neuron function gets messed up. So in Parkinson's, when you lose motor function, that's because this alpha-synuclein protein has started to aggregate and is poking holes in, in nerve cells and your function, your neuromotor function is getting messed up. So we said, let's go see whether hype is involved in this process. Remember I said hype can add AMP to its target proteins. So let's go see if alpha-synuclein can, is a target for hype? Can hype add AMP to alpha-synuclein? And the answer turned out to be yes. So we took this educated guess, but it turns out, yes, hype adds an AMP to alpha-synuclein. Okay, great. So now, if alpha-synuclein gets ampelated, what does that mean? Does that alter this process at all? And turns out it did. Turns out, by adding an AMP, we really reduced the ability of alpha-synuclein to start aggregating and forming these toxic particles. And so that told us that hype-mediated ampelation may be a mechanism by which the cell is just dealing with the stress of, um, of protein misfolding. So, you know, we figured out that, yeah, what, by adding an AMP, we block this process, and the reason we block this process is because the shape of the alpha-synuclein that normally would have aggregated changes. And so we think we now have a way of, if we could activate hype, we can block this process from happening. 
And so that's kind of what we're doing in our lab. Uh, I don't know, my um, animation was a little messed up here. Um, so what we think is happening is that in an aging cell, like as we're getting older, as our neurons are getting older, this alpha synuclein starts to aggregate. As it aggregates, it induces ER stress. That may be a signal that activates hype. Then hype goes and ampullates alpha synuclein and tries to block this process. Okay. So why wait until we get to this stage? Why wait? until we get a lot of aggregated proteins and then activate hype. What if we can somehow activate hype early on? So, so as, you're, as you're starting to maybe see some signs that maybe this patient is going to get Parkinson's, or you know, sometimes football players tend to get Parkinson's because they get traumatic brain injury and that predisposes you to have Parkinson's. So we said, what if we could somehow come up with a drug that could activate hype early so that you start adding AMP, you never start collect, getting aggregates of alpha-synuclein, and then could we use that as a therapeutic for Parkinson's? So it's kind of preemptive treatment. So, so far, all the therapies for Parkinson's are for this stage. Once we've reached the stage, we're trying to stop the symptoms of the disease. We're trying to recover from the damage. But what if instead of waiting for, to get to this stage, what, we, what if we just started early on, started little by little adding some AMP and making sure that this process doesn't even happen? So that's our goal. So we've now got drug screens going on where we're trying to find drugs that can activate hype. We're also, we also are looking for drugs that can inactivate hype because you know, what we think is, yes, we should turn on hype, but we, maybe we don't want to turn it on all the time because that can also be potentially detrimental. So we want to have a nice handle on the activity of hype and see if we can use it as a therapeutic. And so that's really kind of what my lab does that, you know, we, this ampullation is kind of like a baton in a signal relay where one protein talks to another and talks to another. And what we want to do is, understand how this process works so that we can manipulate ampullation with these drugs the way we're trying to manipulate hype um, so that a, a cell that would have been a diseased cell can now become a healthy cell. Okay. And that's, that's the big picture. That's what we do. So that's, that's why I say, you know, we started in bacteria and it's brought us to Parkinson's disease. But I think for me, um, that is the best part of being a scientist, a basic scientist, because we are forging the path, right? Um, we are at the forefront of discovery. And so we have that um, intellectual freedom to say, I, oh, it doesn't matter, I'm a microbiologist, but I'm just following the protein and the protein led me to Parkinson's and I think we can do something really cool over there. And so it's just every day is a new day of discovery and. That's kind of why I'm here. <laughs> That's what That's I amazing. Think. That is. I, I do want to put up a picture of my lab. Like without the students, we can't do anything. Of course, without collaborators and funding, we can't do anything. Um, and. I think that's also another thing that I like about being in biological sciences and at Purdue because it's such a diverse department and it's a very collegial university that we can, we've been able to just branch out into different fields without being too scared. <laughs> well, that's a great point. What are, who are some other people that you do clap? Because I'm thinking Parkinson's, so that's like medical. So besides, you know, here at Purdue with your graduate students and and the Department of Biological Sciences, who are some other like collaborators that you'll work with? Yeah, so at, at Purdue, um, Dr. Chris Roche is one of the leaders in Parkinson's. He and another professor, Jason Cannon, they actually have mouse models and rat brain models for Parkinson's. Uh -huh. And so, um, so we collaborate with um, predominantly with Chris Roche. And as we get more and more into the animal systems, we'll be collaborating with Jason Cannon. Our goal is to try to um, limit the amount of work we're doing with animals. So we want to do the as much as we can with cells and with the enzymology and figuring things out so that then we can, you know, you know, you don't want to be just killing animals for the sake of killing animals, right? So where we go in there, 
um, after we've done a lot of the preliminary work to say, okay, this experiment is going to work or this experiment is going to give us useful data. Um, and then we do the animal work. Um, yeah, so then we also, um, for some of our structure biology, computational stuff, um, there's a few other professors, Daisuke Kihara. Uh, I mean, we've got a lot of, the, the project that I just told you is just one of, just the neurobiology side of things. We've got stuff going on with cancer biology, because this, this process of basic protein folding, mm -hmm. that just gets messed up in any kind of disease, whether it's infectious disease, whether it's diabetes. Um, in cancer cells, it happens a lot because cancer cells are basically our own cells that are just proliferating at a really high rate. Okay? So they're just growing really, really fast, which also means that they're making a lot of protein, which they have to fold really quickly too. And so when you're folding things quickly, you're going to mess up. <laughs> and so, so cancer cells do need um, hype as well. Oh, wow. It's, that, that's kind of amazing how, I mean, you start with finding the bacteria and leading to a disease that impacts society. And uh, so where you are now in the research, I mean, it's, it, it, it took a lot to get to where you are. But now where you are, you're determining which drug interactions uh, right now. It's, it's not like we're like trying out drugs. Like there's not like clinical trials or something oh, like no, that. Oh, no, yeah. So what we're very early in the process. I mean, you'll, you'll notice that um, this is, you know, coming from bacteria, having like zero link with Parkinson's, and then suddenly to say, hey, I think it might be beneficial in Parkinson's. So we, we are, it's all basic science. It's very early in the process. Um, once we figured out this link, the next thing was trying to search for drugs. Um, but then when you search for drugs, you have to go through thousands or tens and thousands of drugs. So you can't be doing that, you know, one reaction at a time. So then what you have to do is you have to take your enzymatic reaction and then convert it into what's called a high throughput assay. So we're high throughput where you can do multiple like thousands of reactions at a time. And so, so that, that was the next step. We had to play around, tweak our, tweak our reaction, get it to the stage where now we could look at tens of thousands of drugs at a time. So we finally got that reaction to work. We got that. Um, we did a pilot screen then because drug screens are very expensive. <laughs> so, so we started first with um, drugs that were already FDA approved um, and drugs that we already knew were not going to be toxic to human cells. And then we did a screen with that to say, okay, let's see, can we even identify anything? You know, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the drug we're going to use, but is this assay going to work at all in giving us some compounds? And so we did then, we did the pilot screen and we found some compounds. What was really nice was that many of those compounds turned, to, turned out to be mimics of ATP. And so since the reaction uses ATP, we got drugs that are mimics of ATP that tells us that we're not just getting like, you know, random hits, we're getting very precise interactions. So now, now that we've done that, we're taking it one step further. Um, now our goal is whatever these drugs, whatever drugs we find, they can't just be delivered to the human body, they have to go to the brain, which means they have to cross the blood brain barrier. So now we're doing our assays with drugs that are optimized for the blood brain, for the central nervous system. And so, so there's a lot of, um, it's a stepwise process. And then once we find those drugs, that won't be optimal. We will have to, we have then teamed up with a chemist, a medicinal chemist, Daniel Flaherty. And with, him, with them, we're going to manipulate the drugs that we find, make little changes, and then see what makes it best um, as a drug. And then we enter then we'd enter animal models, <laughs> then we enter clinical trials. So it takes a long time. Wow. But there are, are a lot of steps in this, uh, in, but that's, that's an awesome journey. And it's, it's like you said, I mean, there, I mean, there's after Parkinson's, I mean, I say after Parkinson's with the hope that, I mean, it's one day that that, that doesn't take lives. One day we can stop that with early onset. And uh, it sounds like this your research will also possibly cross over into the cancer research to understand more yeah. about that. I think that's the beauty of it, that um, 
you know, by understanding basic mechanisms inside the cell, you can kind of, um, kind of step back and uh, try to figure out, okay, why do we ever get to the disease stage? Mm-hmm. You know, there's, yeah, there's, clinic, there's clinical aspects of it. And yes, it's, it's good to be able to deal with the clinical symptoms. Those are very, very important. Um, but uh, sometimes we don't actually know all the nitty gritty players in the pathway. And so every time we identify a new player, I think it gives us new hope that there's a new, maybe a new angle by which we can try to get handle on the disease. And so that's kind of our goal. Oh, I love that. that I mean, that is awesome. That's, uh, that's inspirational biology right there. And I love all the collaborations that yes. all, and it's because we think, oh, okay, some biologist or no pharmacist or wait, was it a chemist? I don't know who made this drug. Well, all of them. It's everyone. And actually, you know, I think that's the one thing that has, you know, we're, we're living in a pandemic. We're working under a lot of uh, limitations. But I think one positive, if I have to take uh, uh, any positive out of this pandemic, out of this COVID situation, is the degree of, of free flow of information that has occurred amongst the scientists. So earlier, you know, you would find something and you'd go, oh, I don't know, I don't want to like release it just yet because I'll, I'll get scooped or somebody else, my co- competitors will jump on it. Well, now sir, it's survival, <laughs> right? And, and so we can't hold on to any piece of data. And I think the amount, the rate at which papers have come out on COVID and the rate at which people have been collaborating, um, the number of scientific conferences we've been able to have because now everything is via Zoom. <laughs> so, so you don't have to worry about traveling. I can, you know, a meeting that would have been in Germany today and I would have potentially a conflicting meeting in Washington, DC, I can attend both of them <laughs> today because it's all via WebEx and Zoom. So, um, so I think that's the positive take on it, that there's been so much flow of information and so much collaboration. Like, you know, science ha- is, if you want to move forward, it is multidisciplinary. Um, everyone's minds coming together. And so I think, you know, that's why I try not to put limits on what we're doing. You know, we've, we've moved into so many areas where, you know, I am not the expert. But unless you venture out, you don't learn, th- learn new things. And so that's, that's that. an excellent point. <laughs> that was beautiful. 